Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Newton Gatoff, Operations Manager here at Spirit Grow. Um, so we've, we're, it looks like the, the weather's kept a few of our, our, our friendlies away this evening, but I'm pleased that you are here to join us to, uh, to say a few words to, to Jen as well, because before we start, I, j I just wanted to remind everyone that this, this may be the last time we see Jen for some time. Well, maybe Should virtually. But ah, okay. Well, we, we, <laughs> are, we are going to be talking about virtual meditation, um, because as of next week, Label, who many of you know is in Israel, will be appearing on a screen right behind Jen here. So uh, I'd encourage you to come along and see how uh, virtual meditation works. Uh, we've never tried it before, but we're, uh, we're hoping for, for good connections all round. So um, Menachem also sends his apologies. He is otherwise engaged. This, this, at the moment, he's talking to parents in a school about how to meditate with their children. So uh, Label's working away in Israel. Menachem's uh, somewhere else in Melbourne, and Jen's here to, uh, to, to, take us, to lead us tonight. But I just wanted to say a few words... Um, before we begin, Jen and Tony Smorgan have, um, have been friends of Spirit Grove for, for many years. The rabbis couldn't tell me how long it was, but it's obviously been some time. And Jen's given much of her time to Spirit Grow uh, on a Monday evening. She's, I've heard her share some wonderful stories about her family. And um, it's helped a lot of people here um, connect with their own family. So I think that's, that's been something that I've, I've noticed Particularly. Ah, well, there you go. That's uh, oh, family that's walks surprise. in on cue. That's perfect. Um, I'd also say that as a result of Jen's intervention on meditation, she's leading meditation in the Melbourne community. So we've, we've really taken some, some steps in addition to Label and Menachem's work. So I guess I'm not, I'm not going to stand here and make a big speech, but I am going to make a little presentation. I have something in a... What did, we didn't know what to get you, Jen. Surprise, Aww. surprise. You've given me so much already. It's how appropriate. Oh, beautiful. Isn't that lovely? The um, and we've just got a little plaque there, um, which reads, May your new home, because you, you're going, I'm assuming, to a new home, will be filled with positive energy, light, and all the blessings that are promised to us in the Torah. Beautiful. And it's from Label and Leo, Menachem and Rachel, and the whole Spirit Grow community. That's so nice. Thank you so much. That's beautiful. Wow. Thank you. Yes, the trophy. <laughs> That's quite a trophy, actually. That's okay, beautiful. Well, I'll put Thank it back you in so much. Box. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. That is really beautiful. Oh, so touched. I just got a, that, not only that beautiful surprise, but my husband and my son, Evan. Stand up a second. Turn around and say hi. hi. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, tell everyone how long you've been meditating. Hi, Tim. Hi. Hey. <laughs> this, this man teaching me 12 and a half years ago. Yeah. I yeah. said to Tony, come to an introductory talk. He said, I'll come, but I'm not going to learn. I said, no problem. And of course he learned, and he hasn't missed a day in about 13 years or whatever. Okay, you get to sit down. This is Evan. Evan, how old are you? I'm nine. Evan's nine. And how long have you been meditating? A year. A year. And how many minutes do you meditate every day? Eleven. Eleven. Amazing. Children usually do it for the number of minutes but of I the age seen, that they are. I sit in Noah's room, so. Yeah, but his brother, who's 11, does it for 11 minutes, so he's had to... Crank it up a little bit. All right. Fantastic. I have a special treat for all of you tonight. My teacher, dearest friend and mentor, is here visiting from Sydney. His name is Tim Brown, and I'm going to have him lead you into meditation today. Actually, maybe I'll get you a little bit going just to see who hasn't ever been here before. And then I'm going to have Tim give you a special treat. Okay, so raise your hand if you've never been here before. Never been here before. One, two, three. Anyone else? Did I miss anybody? Four. Okay. Now, have you ever meditated before? No? Any of you? You've meditated? Have you? So, so, so. Okay. So, 
I'll do a quick intro, and then we'll do a bit of meditation, and then I'm going to have Tim come out and do a knowledge meeting and just share some words of wisdom with you, which he has so many things to share. He has shared a lifetime of wisdom with me through the years, and he actually recently graduated me in a tradition of meditation called Vedic meditation, which Tim teaches over in Sydney and pretty much all over the world, so it's a real special treat to have him here. Um, So you'll get to meet him soon. All right, for those of you who have learned to meditate with me before, you're just going to hear this, you know, you'll pick up something new from what I say, and for those that have not learned before, listen carefully. Meditation is very easy. You naturally know how to meditate, okay? It's an effortless practice in the same way as when you eat something, right? You put the food in your mouth, and then you let go. You don't tell the food where to go. You don't tell which enzymes to meet it in, the, in your tummy, right? You just sit back and relax, okay? In the same way, when you read a book, you have a focal point, the words on the page, right? So what do you do? You read, you read, you read. You read, you read, you read. All of a sudden, stress, tension, and fatigue bubble up as thoughts, and you catch yourself daydreaming, right? The defining moment, you realize you're off your book, the words on the page, and you gently come back, to the beginning, and you start reading again. Reading, 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 reading. You're a little tired, tired, stress, tension, and fatigue pop you back into thoughts again. You've had this experience? Yes? Okay. This process is meditation. It's that simple. You have a focal point, okay? When you are going through that focal point, you're just putting your gentle awareness on it, whether it's words on a page, whether it's when you're in prayer and davening, whether you're listening to a guided meditation could be a focal point, having a mantra, which is just a sweet, mellifluous-sounding word, putting your gentle awareness can be a focal point, and also what we're going to do here today, just your gentle awareness on your breath. Your gentle awareness on the inhalation and exhalation of your breath can be a focal point, okay? There'll be a point at which you're off in thoughts, We don't care what the thoughts are. Daydreaming, shopping lists, to-do lists, worry scenario, mind, a conversation that you had with somebody. Hi, Daphne, how are you? We don't care what it is. But there'll be a moment when you recognize you're off daydreaming. And then you'll gently come back to your awareness of your breath. And a few moments later, you'll catch yourself off again. Okay? I forgot to pick up the Vegemite, then I have to go to the dry cleaners, then I have to call my mother back, blah, 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 blah. There'll be a defining moment when you recognize you're off your focal point, your awareness of breath, and you'll come back. Okay, we're not in the business of clearing our mind of thoughts. It's not physically possible to use thoughts or effort to clear your mind of thoughts. Our mind is a thinking machine, thinking 60 to 100,000 thoughts a day, one after the other after the other. Okay, so we're going to throw that idea out the window. What people are referring to when they say clear your mind of thoughts is a place where you can arrive when you're meditating. It's a quiet place. But it's not a point to get there. It's just to know what it is if you happen to arrive there. Okay, so just to review, we can be four places when we meditate. Four places. We can be on our focal point. In this room, we're going to put our awareness of breath as our focal point. We can be off in thoughts. Okay. We can fall asleep. No problem if that's what your body needs. Just let your chin come to your chest. (laughs) perfectly fine. Or you can arrive at a quiet place, okay? Just similar to this, all of a sudden, oh my God, what was that? Where was I? How long was I there for? That was so strange. I felt like I was nowhere. You're obviously not there anymore because you now have thoughts, but you recognize that you were somewhere very quiet, resting deeply. In the same way, an individual wave becomes one with the ocean, okay? Any questions? No? Good. Simple. The more effortless you are with your awareness of your breath, the deeper experience you will have. Okay? So just relax. If you do nothing but sit and close your eyes and just daydream, everything will slow down. Your heart rate, your intake of oxygen, your blood pressure, things will quiet down. But we take it up a gear by adding a focal point. Okay, so I'm going to lead you into it. Everybody get comfortable. If you can put your phones on airplane mode or silent. Okay, great. 
So I'm just going to ask you all to close your eyes. Just take a couple of minutes. Notice if you're holding tension anywhere in your body. That's fine. Just sit and be with yourselves for a moment. Don't do anything but just witness yourself. Witness any thoughts that you're having, any physical sensations that you're feeling. Just take a couple minutes to just be present with yourself. We don't want to resist any thoughts that come into our minds. We don't want to push anything away. Just accept whatever you're experiencing to be fine. No judgment. Just let that first wave, that flurry of thoughts and de-excitation happen. Remember at any point at which your head begins to feel a little heavy, it's fine to let your chin go down towards your chest. You don't need to pop your head back up or bounce it. Just let it do whatever feels comfortable. We don't resist noise in meditation, hearing anybody breathing next to you, sneezes, coughs, phones ringing. We just take it as it comes. It's a very simple, natural, innocent process. Now very gently, I want you to put your gentle awareness on your breath. Not changing your breath, just witnessing the inhalation and exhalation of your breath. Without changing it, just witnessing it as a focal point. And as you continue to do this, if your mind wanders off or drops off into thoughts, that's wonderful, that's perfect. Remember, stress, tension, and fatigue get released through these thoughts. So we're not trying to push anything away. But at the moment in which we recognize we're off daydreaming, then I'd like you to gently come back to putting your awareness on the inhalation and exhalation of your breath very subtly. I'm going to leave you to it on your own now for a few minutes.
eyes closed. You can let go of your gentle awareness on your breath. And we're going to take a couple minutes to come out slowly. Keep your eyes closed, but you can stretch if it feels comfortable to do so. And in about a minute, we're going to slowly open our eyes. I feel like <clears throat> I feel like Jen should be giving this talk since it's her last night. But thank you very much for the invitation. So, did everybody enjoy that experience? Enjoy that? Great. She's good at it, isn't she? I learned from the best. <laughs> she's uh, she's amazing, and um, I think Melbourne's going to be very sad to see her go. I think she's such a Great teacher, and San Francisco is the winner. Unfortunately, Melbourne is going to miss her, but hopefully she comes back to you and comes back and teaches here a bit. Um, what, what were some of the experiences that people just had there in their meditation? Just anybody have an experience that was worthy of note or something unnoticed? Yes? Anybody experience anything that was interesting, or what did you notice when you were meditating? How about somebody new who's never meditated before? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Body felt nice and relaxed. Okay, good. And not forcing, not trying to force like that. Okay, good. That that I think is one of the most important things with meditation. I think it's one of the things that people think that they should be doing is forcing some experience or trying to make something happen in meditation. Uh, one of my favourite little sayings is, the best meditator is the best delegator. So when we sit to meditate, we're not going in to try and make something happen. We're actually going in to allow the intelligence in the mind and body that as we're all sitting here quietly now is structuring and organising six trillion things per second. Just think about that for a moment. It's an extraordinary thing. Um, us guys hard up doing one thing at a time. You girls can do three, four things at a time. Very impressive to us guys. Uh, the intercerebral cortex, the, the pipeline between the right and left side of the brain in women is four times bigger. So us guys, we're going to have to give that one up to the girls. But that intelligence in the mind and body is capable of structuring and organising six trillion things per second. It's an extraordinary, they're extraordinary organisms, these bodies of ours. And that intelligence in the mind and body during meditation is going to do what it needs to do if we give it the opportunity. So my little saying is the best meditator is the best delegator. So when we sit to meditate, we sit and we delegate to that intelligence in the mind and body that has that capability. If we ever delegate um, to anybody or anything, we should always make sure that who we're delegating to or what we're delegating to is better at it than we are. And these intellects, they've got certain capability, but that intelligence in the mind and body is quite extraordinary. So when we sit to meditate, best to sit and delegate. Here's, here's a period of time, whether it's 10 or 15 or 20 minutes, whatever it is that you sit to meditate, where we're going to give that intelligence in the mind and body to do whatever it needs to do. 
And if we can just understand what our contribution in the process is, the number one and the most important part of meditation is actually sitting down. Getting our backside in the chair is actually the most difficult, the hardest part of meditation because the to-do list's never ending. There's always things to do, always places to be, always phone calls to be made, always you know various chores to be done. So the most difficult part of meditation is actually getting our backside in the chair. And that's, that's number one. Just on that point before I move on, a good way to think about that is this. You know, meditation would seem that it's a very nice thing for us and a very relaxing thing for us. But in fact, meditation is one of the most charitable things you'll do in a day because charity begins at home. And what we've got to learn how to do in this day and age is give to and nourish ourselves because we can't give what we haven't got. I'd love to give you all $10, but I haven't got whatever it is times 10 on me, so I can't give it to you. And this is the thing is that stress, tension, fatigue, building in the mind and body, it robs us of our clarity, our creativity, our energy, our joyfulness, intelligence. And we need to be able to nourish ourselves in order to gain more of that clear, creative, energetic thinking in order to be able to give that to other people. So meditation is something that we're doing not only for ourselves, very good for us, but incredibly good for everybody else around us. And I think that's a good thing to remember because sometimes we can think that maybe sitting in with our eyes closed for 10 or 15 or 20 minutes might be a bit luxurious and a bit self-serving. But it's a good thing to remember that through meditation, we're looking to nourish ourselves in order to be able to assist and support and nourish other people. So when we do get to meditate, we sit, we close the eyes, and we delegate to that intelligence in the mind and body. Here's 10 or 15 or 20 minutes for that intelligence in the mind and body to do whatever it needs to do in this sitting. And my experience, I've been meditating for 18 years, is that's always different. There's no such thing as a standard meditation experience. And that's because the weather's changing, the temperature in the room, your to-do list, what's happening in the body, the seasons are changing. So all of those things are in motion. If we're going into meditation expecting a standard experience, then we're going to be disappointed. So this is why when we sit, we meditate, we sit, we delegate to that intelligence in the mind and body. And then the, first, the next thing we do is we need a point of reference. And Jen spoke about that beautifully. You know, if you've got a mantra, that's a good point of reference. If you've got the breath, which we've all got, that's a very good point of reference. And we need to then bring our awareness gently to that point of reference, whatever that happens to be. Now, as we bring our awareness to that, uh, that point of reference, and the breath is a particularly good one, then what it will do is it will start to allow our awareness to settle as the breath settles. And as that happens, the mind's going to settle. As that happens, the body relaxes. As the body relaxes, uh, we turn off the adrenaline, noradrenaline, cortisol, coagulants, all that flight-fight chemistry that gets caught in the brain, that we get, we get stuck in that flight-fight response with all that stress and flight-fight chemistry. That turns off and the body starts to produce serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin, all that high-grade well-being healing chemistry that the brain and body are designed to run on. We are not designed to run on adrenaline. Uh, that is something that we're designed to activate and to produce when we're being chased by a bear. Most of us aren't being chased by bears in this day and age. Um, so that biochemistry is not really the biochemical cocktail we want to be running on. So when we start to meditate, the mind settles, the body relaxes. We start producing what I call the stay and play biochemistry or bliss chemistry. The opposite of flight and fight is stay and play. And we want to be able to get ourselves into that stay and play response on a more regular basis. So we've sat in meditation, we've closed the eyes, we've allowed that first little wave to kind of come out, it often does, there's often a little activation of the mind initially. We've then gently come to our point of reference, the mind's settled, the body's relaxed, and as soon as there's enough relaxation in the mind and the body, the body is going to release stress or tension or fatigue that's built up in the mind and body over time. And that is going to create activity in the brain and the body. And we should expect that it is a natural part, as Jen said, of a meditation practice. This is not something we should get frustrated about. It's not something that we should be concerned about or think that we're no good at meditating because this is happening. This is a very natural part of the process of meditation. The mind naturally wants to settle into those deeper states, 
The body naturally wants to launder stress, tension, fatigue out of the body. And they are the two components of meditation that we need to acknowledge, understand and allow to take place. So we've sat, we've closed the eyes, we've let that first little wave come. Then when we can, we've delegated to that intelligence, the mind and body. When we can, we gently come to our point of reference. At any point at which the mind moves away from that point of reference, be that mantra or breath, whatever our point of reference is, we're happy for that to happen. It is very much part of our practice. The defining moment is that moment that we have that little thought, whoops, meant to be meditating. Or, you know, hang on, I've forgotten my point of reference. At that point, there is only one thing to do, and that's not to get concerned, not to get worried, not to chastise yourself because you're no good at focusing or concentrating. That's not correct. Everything's gone beautifully. Everything's gone swimmingly to that point. At that point, there is actually only one thing to do in the mind, and that is to smile. Something good just happened. Some stress or tension or fatigue that had been locked in the body for days, weeks, months, years, decades just came out. What was it? Don't know, don't care. It doesn't mean that we had a stressful thought. It could have been just day-to-day -day thinking or little dream sequences or body sensations coming up through the body or those layers of fatigue feeling all, you know, naughty and floppy in meditation. This is all good processing and laundering of stress, tension, fatigue out of the body. So we're happy for that to happen the moment we realise there is only one thing to do and that is to smile inside. And when we realise, we just smile and when we can, gently come back to our reference point. Just gently back to the breath or gently back to the mantra. Or whatever our point of reference is, we gently come back to that. And if we can do that very gently, without forcing, without controlling, then we're going to allow the intelligence, the mind and body to do what it needs to do in this sitting. And that is never the same. Sometimes you'll have very shallow meditations where you won't feel as though you get that deep. That's actually what I would call a body meditation. It means the body, the intelligence, the mind and body is doing a lot of processing because that's what it needs to do. And if we're just very gentle with our practice, not forcing or controlling, then you'll come out of that meditation. You mightn't feel as though you got that deep, but you'll actually feel really good afterwards. Sometimes you might go very deep into meditation you know, and you'll come out and you'll feel good afterwards. Some meditations will start shallow and end up deep. Some will start deep and end up shallow. No two meditations will ever be the same. And really when we understand meditation, it's not actually about the period of time that we're meditating. That's not the point. That's the preparation for the, the mind to settle, the nervous system to launder, to be able to pre prepare us to enjoy a higher state of consciousness to bring to the five, six, seven, eight hours after meditation. This is where all the fun is out here. If we've got that clear, creative, energetic, intelligent, happy self available to engage with the dynamics of day-to-day -day living. And meditation is in itself not a self-fulfilling practice. It is a preparatory exercise. The supreme metaphor for meditation is archery. So the whole goal of archery is to hit the target 25 meters in that direction. If you know what you're doing with a bow and arrow, the first thing we do is we put the arrow in the bowstring and the first thing we do, next thing we do is draw the bowstring back. Now initially that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. I'm trying to put this arrow 25 metres in that direction and I'm going to spend time, effort and energy bringing the bowstring and the arrow away from the target. Initially it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But in drawing the bowstring back we create that massive kinetic potential in the bowstring. The bowstring is now full of potential. We then take aim and release the bowstring and the arrow flies straight and true and hits the mark. This is a bit like meditation. Meditation is this action. It's the going back, but this is not the point. The point is then to be able to come out into life and to be able to bring the dynamism that comes from allowing the mind to settle and the body to relax into that state and to be able to bring that into life, to family, to friends, to careers, to social contributions, all the things that we do with our lives, to be able to bring more of our conscious capability to all of those things. And that's what makes meditation worthwhile. It makes it a worthwhile thing for us. It makes a worthwhile thing for all the people around us, for us to be spending a few minutes, uh, and preferably in the morning, uh, in order to allow the mind to settle, the body to relax, consciousness to expand like that, to be able to launch into the day, and then in the mid to late afternoon, early evening, as it fits in with your schedule, you know, two, three, four, five, six, seven, as it fits in with your day, to sit and meditate there. Hit the pressure valve. 
release the stress and tension of the day and then to be able to come to that next part of the day with a full tank rather than coming to the end of the day, which is often where we spend time with family and the ones that we love the most. We've got this very bad habit that we've developed, which is taking our very finest out into the world and bringing our very worst back to our most loved. It's a bad habit that we've developed. And meditation can be an incredibly powerful um, uh, exercise to help us to manage that experience where we can process on the bus or on the on the bus, on the train, on the plane, in the car. You know, the beauty of meditation when we know how to practice it is that we can do it absolutely anywhere. Noise is no barrier to meditation. If we're hearing a noise outside of us, then we're actually having a thought about the noise. You know, does that dog really have to bark right now? Doesn't it know I'm trying to meditate? You know, if we're hearing that noise, you know, if we're having a thought about the noise, then when we realise... Then we just smile inside, inside, don't get concerned, don't get worried. This is not the naughty, mischievous monkey mind not on the program. If you've ever heard someone say that about your experience in, in meditation, with due respect, they're not quite sure what they're talking about. It's not the naughty, mischievous monkey mind, it's the body releasing that's causing the mind to get caught in the waiting room while the body's releasing something. So we're happy for that to come when we realise, whether it's an outside thought, an internal Outside noise, an internal thought, a body sensation, images bubbling up, dream sequences, it's all good. It's all that the body laundry and we're happy for it. When we realise, we just acknowledge it, smile inside and gently come back to our internal point of reference. And if we can just spend a few minutes in the morning, and ideally if we're going to do this in the morning, if you're an exercise, you might get up and go for your walk or, you know, your swim, although it might be getting a bit cold for that at this time of the year. Um, or whatever it is that you like doing, you might do that first. Have a shower, meditate, breakfast, just something like that is a great program in the morning. If you're not exercising, that's fine. You know, just hop, hop up, wash the face, it's very good, or jump in the shower. It's very good to wake up a little bit before we meditate. If we just kind of wriggle up in bed, pull the doona up and, you know, go into meditation, there's a lot of sleepiness still in the mind and in the brain and in the doona and all over the place. So quite often that'll just take us back into sleep. And while we're happy for sleep to come in meditation, we don't want to invoke it by, you know, doing these kinds of things. So always good to get up in the morning, wash the face, jump in the shower, you know, then sit and meditate. As early into the day as possible is always a good start. Really start the day well like that. And it's always very good to meditate prior to meals wherever you possibly can. Because a couple of reasons, because if we've got food in the stomach, uh, then the body's digesting, which is going to create activity in the body, which will activate the mind, and we're not going to be able to get as deep as we possibly can. Um, also, it's, an, it's understood and known that the first three things that the body will shut down when stress and tension fatigue builds in the mind and body are the, di are the digestive system, the reproductive system, and all the uh, hormones around the reproductive system, and the memory centre of the brain. They're three, the three areas that the body, as it moves into the flight-fight response, identifies that those three areas, are not, um, they're not helpful if we're running and fighting for our life. So the digestion, reproductive, uh, reproductive system and all the hormones around that and the memory centre of the brain get deactivated. The way I think about it, the body kind of goes to the fuse box and flicks those switches and says, don't worry about those things, we're worrying about other things now. Now, it's not possible to be truly well if our digestive system isn't working properly because the digestive system is delivering the building block of the body that we've got tomorrow. So this is why it's very good to meditate prior to eating because as the mind settles, the body relaxes, the mind and body come out of that flight-fight response and into the stay-and-play response, then the digestive system will be activated. Did anybody notice just now when we meditated that their, their tummy started rumbling? Anyone notice that? Okay, that's a very good sign. That's a very good indication. It's, very, it's, hilar it's hilarious. When you get in a big group of people meditating, it sounds like a you know, stomach orchestra, you know, because the tummy, this is your tummy, this is your stomach starting to reactivate and wake back up. This is a very, very good sign. So this is why it's good to meditate in the morning before breakfast. Um, and then we're ready for the day. We launch into the day. And then in that mid to late afternoon, who, um, who around 2, 2.30, 3 o'clock starts to feel a bit weary? Anyone start to feel a bit, you know, snoozy and start thinking about, you know, Snickers and coffee? Anyone starts doing that about 2, 2.30, 3 o'clock? 
that's a, that's a, there's a circadian rhythm shift at that time of the day. And that is a particularly good time to get in and do a, do a 10, 15 or 20 minute meditation. I do a lot of uh, work in corporate, um, uh, in corporate environments these days. And we've got a lot of businesses that are encouraging and subsidising their staff to meditate on company time in around that 2.30, 3 o'clock mark. They're building rooms into their environments to encourage their staff to meditate uh, during those times because it's been shown that efficiency, productivity and creativity rates really start uh, to come back um, when people meditate at around that time. So that's a particularly good time just for everybody in order to be able to do, we've meditated in the morning, we've launched into the day, and then we pull in there again and fill up the tank, hit the pressure valve, fill up the tank again, so we can really enjoy that next part of the day and bring the fullness of our energy to all of the things we do in that second part of the day. And then we can sleep well. When someone's meditating, you know, comfortably and easily, 20 minutes meditation can be equivalent to three to four hours sleep when you know what you're doing. So if someone is meditating for 20 minutes a day, 20 minutes morning and evening, they can get up to six to eight hours of sleep equivalent per day into the mind and into the body. And that's an incredibly important and very powerful thing to do in this day and age. Uh, earlier this year, I was watching a TED talk. Has everyone come across TED.com, TED.com? If you haven't, check it out. Great site. Some of the best speakers in the world on their topics, and it's all free. You can... If you like um, quantum field physics or unified field theorem, there'll be talks on that. If you like, you know, folding paper planes, then there'll be a talk on that. Uh, absolutely, whatever topic, uh, it's a great site. And I was watching a talk by one of the world's leading neuroscientists, and he was saying someone living in a city anywhere in the world in 2016 is being exposed to the same levels of stimulation in one day that someone 200 years ago would have been exposed to in their whole lifetime. And he graphed it. It was absolutely fascinating. And it showed how over, over the 250,000 years of current, the, the human nervous system pretty much as it is today, you know, stimulation levels were relatively low. And then he talked about particular events. And, you know, then there was this event and that event. Electricity was a big one. When electricity kicked in, then the stimulation levels really started to rise. And then, you know, then there was cars and aeroplanes and, and it gets to the last 30 years and this graph just starts to go vertical. Um, I came through university, finished university in 1995 and I didn't uh, submit one of my assessments via computer in 1995. You know, I didn't have a mobile phone when I went travelling. I ended up living and working in Uzbekistan for a couple of years. I'm not quite sure how I ended up out there, but I was in working in agriculture, actually, and in my former life, um, and I ended up working in the cotton industry out there. We didn't have mobile phones out there. Um, you know, that's not that long ago. That's only, you know, 20 years, 20, 25 years ago. There were mobile, mobile phones. We didn't have them there. But, you know, this is all happening at such a rate. We're living in extraordinary times. I'm guessing as we're sitting here now, we're sitting in a confluence of Wi-Fi environments. I'm guessing we've all picked up a phone today. I, I got on a pressurised tube, went to 40,000 feet and travelled at 800 kilometres an hour today from Sydney. Pretty impressive, huh? You know, we think nothing of it. Think nothing of it. But this is such a new phenomenon. These are such new things for the human nervous system. And we don't really think too much about it. It's just our lives. It's the way that things are. But these human nervous systems, these human brains and nervous systems are being exposed to a lot of demands, a lot of stimulation. And this is why it's so important to give the mind and body the opportunity to, to rest, to rest deeply. The paradox is this, these days we need more rest to accommodate for the stimulation, but we don't have time. And that's why meditation is such a powerful thing, because when we can just sit for a few minutes, morning and evening, it can really allow the mind and body to recharge. I kind of talk about it's a bit like the Formula One pit stop. You know, you get in there. You know, a few minutes, like the, the car comes in, it's new tyres, you know, fill up the tank, clean the screen, you know, back on track. This is meditation is a way that we can really utilise and get deep rest, deep relaxation into the mind and body and it can allow us to operate in a more dynamic way in, in the world. And I think the world really needs more people that are thinking more clearly, more creatively, more energetically, more intelligently. 
We've got to work out how to access more of that clear, creative, energetic state more consistently. And these 40 billion neuron brains that we've got on the top of our, um, our spines are incredible supercomputers. Neuroscience is telling us that we're using somewhere between 5 and 20% of our brain capabilities. We're a bit of an embarrassment, us humans. We've got these great brains that we're only using a fraction of. We've got to work out how to open up that capability and how to bring that to the world. I think we're being challenged, bless you, um, we're being challenged to work out how we can bring more of our conscious capability to the world and to make a, a bigger contribution. The world needs more net contributors. There's a lot of net taking. People are taking more out of the grid than they're putting in. We need to work out as individuals how we can put ourselves in a position where we can bring more to our family, our friends, our communities. We can make a bigger contribution. And as I said before, we can't give what we haven't got. If we're stressed and tired and consciousness is constricted, then we can't give what we haven't got. And that's why it makes it so important that we learn how to fill up our own tank, do the, do the defrag on the hard drive for the technologically, you know, those that understand all of that. But to, you know, hit the pressure valve, fill up the tank and to be able to launch into the world. And when we can understand that this is the point of meditation, it's not just some self-indulgent sitting with the eyes closed, you know, getting rid of the world for a few you know, minutes, whatever, and only we benefit, then it really makes sense to spend some time doing this on a daily basis. And it can make a big difference. And not only to us, but everybody else around us. And that's why I think you know, more and more people are being engaged by meditation and why we're starting to realise that it really does have value and why more and more people are starting to get interested in this whole thing. When I came back from my teacher training 15 years ago and I was a rugby playing, beer drinking, agricultural economist before I started teaching meditation. And uh, this was not really my field at all. And, um, but I learnt and fell in love with it and, and decided to teach and did my training and came back and I, you know, I used to go to people's birthday parties or you know a dinner party and someone would say so Tim what are you doing these days and I'd say oh I teach meditation they pick up their drink and walk up the other end of the bar <laughs> you know <laughs> these days um you know I go to a dinner party or a birthday party and people say so what do you do Tim for a living and I say oh I teach teach meditation they say stay there I'm coming to your side of the table I need to talk to you and you know that's just in a short period of time we're starting to see that the interest in this is really starting to grow and it's a simple thing that we can all do uh, that can make a, a big difference. And it does take a bit of time, like the drawing back of the bowstring. It does take a bit of time, but when the benefits that we can bring are so great, it, it makes sense to take that time for ourselves in order to be able to bring more to others. And I think that's what we all need to you know, learn uh, or we all need to, to find within ourselves the ability to give more. But we need to give to ourselves first. Charity begins at home. We've got to start here. And meditation is a great way to do that. Any questions about any of that? Can I answer a question for you? Or Yeah. Over the past couple of weeks, yeah. I've been spending about 15, 20 minutes meditating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what, so, de like deliberately or? No, my yeah. mind just goes off from dreams and daydreams and such. Yes. So you've sat to meditate and you're kind of going through the process and the next thing, an hour's gone by? Is that what happens? One, and, one hour and 20 minutes gone by. Okay. Well, that's a lovely thing to afford. That's a, that's a nice experience. I wake up early. Uh, there you go. That's great, which is fantastic. And I think that process oriented thinking is allowing that daydreaming is not. What it is, it's your body processing. And all those little, what we call them sanskara. Sanskara is where we get our word scar from. These little, we were in a particular state of consciousness, an event took place, we got a little overwhelmed by that experience somewhere along the line. And these little impressions get laid down in the nervous system. And that's those stress, we, we call them stresses. But the body doesn't release those one at a time. It releases a whole lot of those simultaneously. And it releases this little one here and this little one here and this little one here. And it releases a little of these all at the same time. And the mind will then take all those little bits and put them into a storyline um, that makes sense while we're having it. 
uh, but in fact, when we reflect on it, it makes no sense whatsoever. So that's what dreaming is. You know, when we dream, you know, there's grandma, you know, with that friend from university, you know, with the barista from the cafe down the road. And while we're having that experience, it all makes so, you know, while we're in it, it all makes so much sense. Come out of it and you think, what on earth was that all about? That was weird. Now, this is the body processing. And this is a very, very good thing. So that daydreaming is your body processing the sanskara out of the system. And it's a very good thing because once that process is out, it's going to clear the mind and it's going to you know, create more room on the hard drive uh, for you to be able to bring to the rest of the day. And it's a very good thing, especially when we're very outcome orientated generally in the world. To be able to give the mind and body the opportunity to be process orientated is a very good thing for the body to do. If you get an opportunity, it is a very nice th thing to do after meditation. It's a little bit of an optional extra, um, is to lie down in Shavasana or just you lie. It's everyone's favorite yoga position. It's this one on the floor. Uh, if you get the chance after meditation to just lie down on the floor with your hands about 30 centimeters from the side of your body, feet about 30 centimeters apart and just have five, 10 minutes there, it is a very nice thing to do. And it will really just allow things to settle out um, I call it meditator's dessert. It's optional, but very, very nice. Uh, whenever you get a chance, have that five, ten minutes after just to really let things go, uh, you know, allow some daydreaming. If you're on a holiday or a weekend, you can even have a little snooze. It's a very nice thing to do, and it will really benefit the mind and benefit the body. Very nice thing to do. So this is a good thing. The body's processing all that stuff that we've locked in the system over time. And we've all got that stress and tension, those sanskara locked in. You know, being a kid, growing up, uh, sibling rivalries, schoolyard politics, relationships, friendships, um, all the challenges of life, that stress and tension does build. And it doesn't need to be, you know, overly dramatic. It's just the body loads up with this stress and tension fatigue and it interferes with us. We need to work out how to launder that out of the fabric of the nervous system. And what you're experiencing is exactly that. You're meditating and then your body's using and taking an opportunity to do exactly that. It's putting the, putting the garbage out of the system. It's a good thing. Any other? Yes. Yeah, so if, in fact, from a meditator's point of view, sleep is highly overrated as a, me as a rest method. Uh, because what we actually need is we need rest. We don't need sleep, we need rest. Um, sleep is a method of rest, but we can get, and it's, been, it's, it's a scientifically and medically proven fact that a meditator can access five times deeper rest in, in meditation than they can in sleep. Now, the reason for that is our ancestors that at some point a long, long time ago were all around a fire somewhere or other, and they were susceptible to animal and enemy. So the ones that survived were ones that built in a mechanism in the body that while they were unconscious, the body kind of kept the motor running like a getaway vehicle. It was like, just in case, just in case, if anything comes, I can leap up and either fight or run away. So our ancestors have all got this, uh, our ancestors had this and it's come through. So when we go to sleep, we do get a degree of rest, but the body's still got this, got the motor running just in case. Now what happens is when we're sitting upright, back supported, head and neck free, which is the way that we should meditate, then what happens is because we're in that somewhat alert position, the mind is able to access a state of rest where it's able to go into what we call the restfully alert state where the mind and body are completely at rest, but consciousness is still there. Now, because consciousness is still there, consciousness says, if, if anything threatening were to come, I'd know about it early and I could deal with it. In between now and then, I can completely relax. As a result of that, the body turns the motor off, if you like. It's a bit like turning the motor off in your car, but clicking back onto the electrics. So the electrics are on, consciousness is present, but the motor's off. And that's why we can access states of rest five times deeper than sleep in meditation. So this is why we can get profoundly deep states of rest in meditation. And, you know, this is why 20 minutes, you know, when someone's meditating, getting full benefit can be equivalent to three to four hours sleep. So someone's meditating twice a day, they're getting six to eight hours rest equivalent per day before they, before they lie down at night. That means that they've done a lot of processing in meditation, which means they don't have to do that at night. There's a lot of people experiencing insomnia, you know, this is a big issue these days. 
And what that is, is it's the stress tension building over the day. It's not being processed. We lie down at night. The body starts to relax and the nervous system starts to release and starts to have to do the filing. And that disturbs and brings people back out of the sleep state. Meditators start to report that insomnia goes away fairly quickly because we're processing that out proactively with meditation. Therefore, the body doesn't have to do that work at night. Therefore, we can sleep properly. We get deeper sleep, but we actually need less of it because we're getting good sleep. We need less of it. Um, and, and therefore, we, we find ourselves waking up fresher in the morning, which means we've got time to meditate, and the whole thing starts to go like that. My experience is, you know, I, you know, I used to be a kind of needed eight or nine hours sleep. My experience is, you know, that came back to eight, then back to seven, back to six. You know, my experience is now kind of somewhere between five and a half, six hours sleep and two lots of 20 minutes meditation. I'm getting kind of 12 to 14 hours sleep equivalent per day and kind of six hours and 40 minutes of, of rest in my day. And that's, I'm not trying to wake up early. I just find myself waking up at about that time of the day. Did I answer your question or not? You have. Yeah, you have. I'm a very deep sleeper. Yeah. The train could come through. Yeah. Okay, I wouldn't wake up. Yes. Yeah, and, that's, and what's happening is, and that's another, that's, people will go either one way or the other, which is they'll, uh, they'll either, you know, not get enough sleep, you know, they, they're waking up insomnia experience, or they're, you know, they need a, a, enormous amounts of sleep. This is what stress and tension does, it creates polarity in experience. And quite often people will do, they'll have eight or nine hours sleep and wake up tired, because the body's actually been doing the night shift, it's been working all night, trying to process out. Um, and as a result of that, They've been unconscious, but they actually haven't been resting that deeply. So this is why people wake up exhausted, you know, because the body's actually been working all night. So if we can start to give the mind and body that opportunity to do that proactively, then the body doesn't have to do that in the evenings. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, I've been doing hypnosis for two years. Yeah. Um, always been a very intense person. Obviously, yeah. I love my hypnosis. And then I yeah. had the pleasure of starting, because I've tried meditation. Yep. Before, yes. But then I started with Jen and yep. he has the most amazing persona that calms. And I notice when I do it, sometimes I think I'm breathing, yes. but I'm not sure. Yes, yeah. Um, and I go to it, I can't move my hands yes. like cement. Yes, yes, good. My body. Yep. But I'm curious why the breathing, sometimes I know I'm, my breathing slows down. Yep. Sometimes I don't even know if I am breathing. Yes. Of course I am. Yep. So what happens? It's 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 the breath. Uh, the breath is a direct has a direct correlation with the amount of metabolic activity in the body. So if it's like if we're exercising, there's a lot of metabolic activity, which means lots of activity in the body. Therefore, there's there's the <sighs> we need a lot of oxygen coming in and out of the body. So when the mind goes into these profoundly deep deep states of rest that you're reporting, there's so little activity in the body that the body doesn't need additional oxygen. So we've got six to eight litres of oxygen going round and round in the, in the bloodstream at any given moment. If you're resting very, very deeply, then the body doesn't need additional oxygen for a period of time. And this is actually a common experience, reportage of meditators, is they will e they, their breath will get very, very faint. It'll get much deeper in the body. When stress and tension builds, we tend to breathe right up here in the top of the chest. When you start to meditate, you'll start to feel the breath going deeper and deeper into the body. But what will happen is the volume will get smaller and smaller. And even to the point of breath suspension, where you might even have those moments, you'll, you'll have a little moment where things go very still, and then maybe the next thought is, oh my goodness, I haven't taken a breath for a moment. And the next thing you'll do, you'll do this, you know, that kind of thing, and then that kind of thing. So there's been so little activity in the body that your body hasn't needed additional oxygen, and so you haven't needed to breathe. You've had to either very, very faint breath, it's very deep in the body but very little volume, or even going into breath suspension. So there will be times when you stop breathing. <laughs> and it's actually a very good sign. That feeling, did anybody else or has anyone else felt that thing in their hands where their ha hands go really heavy in meditation? This is a very, very good sign. Uh, this, is the body, uh, this is the body resting five times deeper than sleep. You can't have that experience unless the body is resting five times deeper than sleep. Medically it's referred to as para-anesthesia. Uh, it sounds deadly, doesn't it? But it's actually a very, very good experience. And what it is, is it's a clear indication that your brain is flooding with serotonin and dopamine. 
75 to 80 percent of all the neurons in your brain are connected to your hands and feet. And so the first thing that we will feel as that biochemistry shifts is in your hands and your feet. And there's that feeling for those that haven't experienced it yet where you kind of lose track of where your hands are. Can't tell whether they're in your lap or apart or you can't kind of tell where they are. It's quite a funny feeling. But it's a very, very good indication that the mind has gone very deep. The body's resting very deeply. It's a good sign. And don't worry, you're not going to pass out. As soon as you need to breathe, your, your body will breathe. Hop up here. Yeah, great. Thank you, because we have another person coming to teach at 8.15. Oh, great. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much for having me. Nice to meet you. Um, get, it, get in the chair and meditate. You know, get in that chair once. You know, once is great. Twice is even better. You know, start to just run a little experiment. I'd encourage you to run an experiment for one week. One week. Get, in a, get in the chair and meditate once or twice a day for one week and see how you feel. And uh, I think you'll be delightfully surprised. Tim will be outside in the lobby if you have a few more questions and want to share it with him. My father always used to say, if you, give, if you have anything in your life, leave it in better condition than it was given to you in. So I'm leaving you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.